it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, in this talk, um, I would like to start with the very basic question about our universe. Um, the space-time of the universe is accurately described by classical general relativity on the largest scales. Uh, and the question is whether or not this classical space-time had a beginning. And if it did, then what determined the initial conditions at the beginning? So I'm going to argue that there probably was a beginning and uh, the initial state, one can try to determine it by applying quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole, that is, in the framework of quantum cosmology. And finally, I'll uh, review some conceptual problems that arise in this approach. The idea of an eternal universe without a beginning has always been very attractive to physicists because that way one can try to avoid the perplexing questions associated the, with the beginning. Um, however, this idea runs into some problems, as I will discuss. Um, so first, uh, let me uh, review one specific scenario which gave some hope of having a model of an eternal universe. It is the scenario of eternal inflation. Um, cosmic inflation is a period of very fast, accelerated expansion of the universe. Um, and um, it explains some puzzling features of the Big Bang and also makes predictions which are I would say spectacularly supported by observations. So inflation has become the leading cosmological paradigm by now. Um, an important feature of inflation is that it is eternal to the future. Um, that is, it, hap it ended in our part of the universe some 14 billion years ago, but it still continues in remote regions. Um, the reason is that the end of inflation is triggered by quantum probabilistic processes, and it doesn't happen everywhere at once. Uh, exactly how this happens depends on the model, and here I, would, I will outline only one version, but this is the feature of basically all models of inflation. So here uh, in this cartoon, uh, this yellow background is the inflating, exponentially expanding space. And uh, bubbles of low energy phase, like the one we live in, spontaneously pop out and start expanding. Uh, they expand very fast, but the inflating space between them expands even faster. And this makes room for more bubbles to form. And this process continues forever. We live in one of the bubbles and see only a small part of it. Uh, so with this uh, picture, uh, one can ask, why not extend this same dynamics towards infinite past, and then you will have a universe which has always been like that, without a beginning and without an end. This, however, is impossible. And... Uh, it, uh, the statement follows from a theorem that I proved with uh, Arvind Borda and Alan Guth some years ago. So the theorem states uh, that a universe that is on average expanding must have a beginning, very loosely stated. Um, so if the universe is infinite to the past, uh, then the world lines of all particles can be infinitely extended to the past. 
Uh, in general relativity, the ordered lines are described by geodesics, and so uh, the universe without a beginning must have all geodesics extendable to infinite past. Uh, such space-time in which this is possible is called past geodesically complete. Uh, so what this theorem says is that if the space-time of the universe, if the universe is on average expanding, that is, it may have periods of expansion and contraction, but expansion wins, and so um, uh, the universe expands on average. So such a uni in such a universe uh, cannot be past geodesically complete. Um, So uh, a universe is called geodesically incomplete if there exists even one geodesic which cannot be extended to past infinity. Uh, but here one can make a must, much more, uh, a, a much stronger statement. All geodesics directed to the past cannot be extended to past infinity except perhaps a set of measure zero. Um, so, uh, I will not get into the proof of the theorem and even uh, in the explanation of what exactly this uh, expansion of average means, uh, but all the, these terms can be rigorously defined. And um, I, only, I will only say that this theorem does not assume any uh, symmetries of space-time, it is quite general. Uh, and also, it is purely geometric. It doesn't assume anything about Einstein's equation. So if you modify Einstein's equation, it still applies. Now, if you apply this to inflationary scenario where the universe does expand, um, the conclusion is that all geodesics extended to the past must run into some obstruction. They should end. And this means that the inflationary space-time must have a past boundary. And this is what we call a beginning. Another popular model is a cyclic universe. Uh, it was popular in the 1930s, uh, but then people realized that it runs into a problem with uh, second law of thermodynamics. If you have repeated cycles, in each cycle the entropy grows. So after a finite number of cycles, you should run into um, thermal, you, you should end up in thermal equilibrium. But then uh, Richard Tolman realized that there is a simple way out of this, and that is to assume that in each cycle, the universe expands more than it contracts. So the cycle ends with a greater volume of the universe. So the entropy grows and the volume grows, and this is okay if the entropy per unit volume does not grow. So that would be fine. And this version of scenario was discussed by Paul Steinhardt and collaborators. So this is okay, but uh, such models, uh, in such models, the universe is on average expanding, obviously, right? And so, according to the theorem, they must be past geodesically incomplete. So you cannot have a past eternal universe which is cyclic. So in this talk, I will be focusing on inflationary scenario. And so, um, as I said, uh, the theorem suggests that inflationary universe must have a beginning. And so we must face the issue of initial conditions. Um, so a number of people thought that maybe what one sh uh, could do is to try to uh, address this problem quantum mechanically. So there is some quantum phase initially which uh, describes the origin of the universe. Um, and this is the approach that I'm going to discuss. Um, and the picture, uh, this, this has been developed uh, in 1980s and more slowly later on. 
so the picture that has emerged from this uh, development is that a compact inflating universe can spontaneously nucleate out of nothing. Where nothing I put in quotation marks, and what I mean by that is the state with no classical space and time. So in quantum cosmology, uh, the wave function of the, the, the universe is described by a wave function. Uh, and uh, this wave function de is defined on what is called the superspace, which is the space of all three geometries and compact three geometries and uh, meta field configurations denoted here by phi um, on those three geometries. Uh, psi satisfies the wheeler dewitt equation, h psi equal to zero, where h is the Hamiltonian operator. And symbolically, this uh, equation has this form. Uh, so it's really, uh, similar to a Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, del squared is the uh, superspace Laplacian or D'Alembertian, probably more like D'Alembertian because the metric on superspace is indefinite. And u is some potential, which you can write down, but I will, its specific form is not important for what I'm going to discuss. Um, so, okay, so we have this uh, equation, and uh, there is a number of issues that one needs to address to proceed with this program. Uh, first of all, we know that this is like Schrodinger equation, but without time. So psi is independent of time. And um, uh, this, uh, of course, was recognized by Bryce DeWitt, who developed this formalism. And uh, the resolution of this uh, that he proposed was that uh, clocks that measure time are parts of the universe. And so time should be defined in terms of some of the superspace variables, geometric or meta variables. Um, now, another question is how do we define probabilities? Um, one cannot simply write psi squared, right? Because psi squared in ordinary quantum mechanics is not an arbitrary choice. Psi squared is. Uh, component of conserved current, and so this choice ensures that probability is conserved. Uh, and here, psi squared is not a component of a conserved current for this formal equation. So this, we have to, dis, uh, to address this. Um, and um, another question is, in order to solve this Wheeler-Dewitt equation, uh, one has to specify the boundary conditions for psi. Because obviously this equation has an infinite number of solutions, and the boundary conditions will select one. So in the rest, uh, I will now discuss in turn these two last issues. Now, how we define probabilities. The definition should be such that it reduces, that the theory reduces to classical general relativity, or to ordinary quantum mechanics in appropriate limits. That is, it should satisfy the principle of correspondence principle. So um, let's see if that can be satisfied. So since we want to uh, define probability, uh, a natural place to look is at the conserved current. This is the, the equation is, uh, has the structure of Klein-Gordon equation, and the conserved current for Klein-Gordon is this current. It is conserved, right? And so we can now define probabilities on hypersurfaces in superspace. So we take the, some hypersurface, sigma. D sigma is the surface element on it, and J D sigma is the probability um, of having the configurations in that element. <laughs> so, uh, 
So this guarantees unitarity. This integral j d sigma will be equal to 1 on all such hypersurfaces if it is equal to 1 on one of them. Um, now, the problem with this is that uh, this uh, definition does not give a positive definite probability. It is the same problem that one encounters trying to define probabilities in Klein Gordon uh, for Klein Gordon equation for scalar particles. Now, the only way that I know of to deal with this problem uh, is through a semi classical approach. So let me outline what, what that involves. So suppose these superspace variables, geometric G and matter phi, can be divided in two classes classical, that is, semi classically behaving uh, variables denoted by C, and the rest of them is Q quant quantum variables. Some semi-classical variables are needed because otherwise we cannot define time. And we do need semi-classical clocks. Otherwise, if clock can go back and forth uh, by quantum fluctuations, we are in trouble. So with this division, the wave function will be a superposition of terms of this form. Uh, the classical variables are described by WKB form. And uh, chi is just the remaining the, fun the wave function of the quantum variables, which also depends on classical variables. Like now, if you substitute this ansatz in the wheeler dewitt equation, then to the leading order, you find that it just gives you a Hamilton-Jacobi equation for this classical action S. Uh, and solution of Hamilton-Jacobi equation describes an ensemble of classical universes. So if this is superspace, uh, this, equation, uh, this uh, function S uh, describes uh, a congruence of classical trajectories of the universe. So through each point in superspace, there is a trajectory. Mm, satisfying the classical equations of motion here. And we can construct this conserved current. And now we can ask, is this positive? The answer is that you can make it positive uh, as follows. You have choose this hypersurface sigma on which, uh, on which this, um, this probability distribution is defined. You choose it in such a way that these classical trajectories all cross sigma in the same direction. So you don't allow the trajectories cross it and then go back and recross. So you choose your hypersurfaces that such that they cross only once each of the trajectories. Um, and uh, that guarantees that the probability, classical probability distribution is positive. Then you go to the next semi-classical approximation uh, that gives you, uh, that treats this quantum part of the wave function. And you find that uh, the wheeler dewitt equation gives you the ordinary Schrodinger equation for this chi. And this time t that appears in this equation is defined in terms of the classical trajectories. And then the conserved current is this positive definite current that I just described times chi squared. And chi-squared, of course, is the usual quantum mechanical uh, probability. So we fully recover uh, ordinary quantum mechanics with this approach, uh, both the equation and the probability definition. Um, the only thing I should uh, emphasize here is that uh, probabilities in this approach are defined only approximately uh, with the accuracy of the semi-classical approximation. OK, so um, now I want to 
get to the question of boundary conditions. <coughs> In ordinary quantum mechanics, how do we impose boundary conditions? Our choice of boundary conditions depends on the setup external to the system. So if you have a scattering experiment, you say that, okay, particle A comes from the left, particle B comes from the right. This, these are your boundary conditions. Uh, in the case of a universe, uh, there is nothing external to the universe. So uh, it appears that the choice of boundary conditions should be unique, and uh, it should be postulated as an independent physical law. Um, a number of suggestions have been made for the form of this law, and here I'm going to discuss, to review briefly, um, uh, two of them which uh, have been extensively discussed in the literature. Um, for this discussion, it will be convenient to use the path integral representation of the wave function. So the wave function can be expressed like this uh, path integral, um, and the integration here uh, ends at the, uh, if the wave function is on geometry G and matter field configuration phi, then the endpoint of all these histories being integrated over are this particular, is this particular configuration. Now the question of boundary conditions in this formulation reduces to the question what is the class of paths being integrated over here? Okay, one uh, proposal for the, this law of boundary conditions, for the choice of class of paths, is the hartle hawking wave function. And uh, they suggested that we should integrate over Euclidean geometries that is, we do a Euclidean continuation from time t to Euclidean time tau. And then uh, we integrate over compact Euclidean four geometries, right, like shown here, which are bounded of the, by the three geometry in the argument of the wave function. Now this, uh, as it stands, this formulation, this proposal has a problem. The problem is that the Euclidean action SE is unbounded from below. And uh, so it becomes arbitrarily negative and the integral is badly divergent as it stands. Uh, the way out of this, suggested by Hartle, Hawking, and collaborators, was that we should actually integrate over complex metrics. Not really Euclidean metrics, but complex metrics. Um, however, the space of, compact metric, uh, of complex metrics is very large, and it is not clear how one chooses the integration contour in this huge space. And indeed, when this proposal was applied to specific uh, simple models, uh, one needs to choose the class, the integration co contour differently for different models. So uh, in application to inflationary cosmology, a choice can be made of a simple model where the universe is spherical uh, of radius A, and uh, which is dynamical, and uh, one adds also a field phi, which is the inflaton with a potential V of phi. And um, one can use the radius of the universe, which at least, at least initially one expects to expand, uh, and so it is monotonic as a time variable, and find the distri probability distribution for the field phi. And this is the uh, distribution one finds. You can see that it is peaked exponentially 
at smallest possible values of the potential. Um, and that means that the universe originates with the smallest possible uh, vacuum energy. This V of phi basically pl plays the role of vacuum energy or um, cosmological constant uh, in inflationary scenario. So inflation, uh, one would want to start it with high value of the potential, and then the field file rolls down to smaller values. And here we have the opposite situation that the universe starts with very small V of phi. So this actually disfavors inflation. Um, another uh, proposal that has been discussed is the, what is called the tunneling wave function. And here, the path integral is Lorentzian. We don't do any analytic continuation. And we integrate between the uh, vanishing geometry, right? so at just a point, and the given configuration of a Lorentzian paths. Um, so this is uh, kind of corresponds to the picture of the universe uh, originating from nothing. Here, this point, you can think, represents nothing, and you consider transitions from there to a finite universe. And the probability distribution for V is very similar to what I had for hartle hawking but with crucial difference in sign. So with this um, distribution, the Initial conditions of the universe predicted by this wave function are actually favorable for inflation. So it is the highest uh, vacuum energy density and the smallest initial size of the universe. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I argued that inflationary cosmology is incomplete without initial conditions for the universe. And uh, one can try to address this issue by in quantum cosmology and try to determine the, the probability for distribution, probability distribution for initial states. However, in this program, we need to know the boundary conditions for psi. Um, now, the tunneling wave function favors initial states suitable for inflation while hartle hawking wave function does not. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that both of these proposal are, proposals are now work in progress, so, because we cannot really, we can only calculate these wave functions in simple models. Uh, also, I emphasize that in quantum cosmology, probability and unitarity, therefore, are approximate concepts. Uh, which are defined only with the accuracy of semi-classical approximation, uh, which is not, it's not clear whether it is a satisfactory situation. And finally, uh, it's, uh, it, it would be great if we could derive the boundary conditions for the wave function from some fundamental theory. Uh, however, at present, we have no idea how this can be done. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, you didn't say anything about observable predictions or consequences or anything like that. I mean, do you have any hope that by observing something in the universe, we can learn the, the, you know, some of the part of this you mean puzzle. How, how this can be tested observationally? Yeah. Well, um, actually, uh, I'm skeptical about it. You could say, the way I describe it here, uh, you could say, OK, observationally, you can exclude hartle working wave function because it predicts uh, very low initial energy. However, if you have very small cosmological constant, there is a non-zero probability 
of tunneling to a high cosmological constant. So in principle, you can have a scenario where the universe starts with in a hartle hawking state, but then eventually you have a multiverse with different bubbles, uh, and it populates all possible states. So I don't know how, in general, uh, make testable predictions, unfortunately. So to follow on <coughs> Douglas's comment, <coughs> by introducing cl classical variables, you have built in one of the most striking aspects of our universe, its homogeneity. If you allowed the quantum variables to be in homo the classical variables to be in homogeneous in the early universe, you would not get an approximation to our universe, I take it. Um, well, um, I I'm not sure that I really assumed that. Um, here, uh, in this uh, general approach, um, I just take the general form of the wheeler dewitt equation, right? I'm not saying that uh, these classical variables C are necessarily variables describing some parameters of a homogeneous universe. For example, you can take the Kasner universe, well, Kasner universe is homogeneous, but it is certainly an isotropic. No, so you don't have an explanation for why our universe is so homogeneous? Um, well, uh, th there is a, a sort of explanation. So for example, if you take the universe, uh, a spherical universe, which is certainly homogeneous, and then add uh, perturbations, right? So then you can look at the wave function for perturbations and you discover that it is peaked at small perturbations, right? So um, the wave function tells you that the, uh, at least uh, in this class of initial states, where the universe is approximately more or less homogeneous, small perturbations are favored, right? So that, does that go some way to addressing your question? Yeah. But then you have built in a homogeneous classical universe around which you put perturbations that are quantum. Well, uh, Jim, look, uh, they, are not, they are all quantum, right? Simply, the variable C are treated in, using WKB, right? And the uh, other variables are uh, unrestricted. Cannot do better. Uh, hi, I, I got lost exactly on this slide, so I have a question. These, these sigma surfaces are chosen so that the currents cross them each only once. And the currents have no divergence, but I missed the part where the currents can't be in a loop. The currents if, can... Um, if these could flow in a loop, they'd still have no divergence, but I can't then define the um, sigmas. Well, uh, I think you can, you can define variables. In principle, you can imagine that some variables running in a loop, but you can redefine this variable so, so that uh, when you make a complete loop, it, instead of coming back to initial value, it kind of goes... Uh, so you open up the, what is it called, the covering, covering space. Of the, so then you will not have this problem. Thank you for the, this is really interesting. Um, this comment about defining the probabilities approximately with the semi-classical expansion, could you expand on it? Is there a way you could see an effect of that in nature, like what does that mean for an observer in the space time? Yeah, I, I thought of that, and actually, I had a question in the conclusions should we be able to derive corrections to quantum mechanics? Uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that uh, there, there should be some corrections, but uh, then I thought that it is sort of a silly question because the uh, accuracy of the semi classical, if the classical variables. 
uh, describe uh, our uh, large-scale universe, uh, then these corrections uh, will be suppressed kind of by the size, by the ratio of your quantum subsystem, Hamiltonian and the um, Hamiltonian of the whole universe, at least. Uh, so I thought that probably these corrections will not be significant, but that was kind of, uh, I, I don't remember anybody uh, trying to carefully check this and actually write down the corrections and see when, under what conditions they will be large. Could I ask a question? Um, so, I mean, you mentioned about these complex contours, and you also mentioned about, um, uh, you know, but we don't know how to choose the paths. But there is a very well-defined de theory, as you know well, with picard lefschetz theory that people are now using a lot. So I wonder if you had any comments on that. You know, the, the idea of using complex paths and not real paths, and uh, using the steepest depends ap approximation. And there is a very sophisticated mathematical work that has been done recently, again, in the context of mini superspace, but again, all the real calculations are in the mini superspace yeah. in here also. <laughs> so it seemed to me that, yeah, that there, is a, uh, there is a huge progress, and I wonder I what think, your reaction uh, is to that. Sure. Uh, I think there is nothing wrong with using complex paths, and this uh, path integral representation of the wave function usually, uh, obviously works with a complex uh, set of paths, but uh, the question is, uh, what is the, there is no general prescription for the choice of the class of paths. So in the end, it looks like Hartle uh, and uh, Halliwell and their collaborators just uh, gave up. In the last paper, they said, okay, let us just look at the saddle points and the wave function is uh, a superposition of contribution of different saddle points and the amplitudes uh, that go, go with different saddle points are not specified. So it basically uh, says that the definition of this wave function is incomplete. <laughs>